welcome to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects my patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, and we'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio. Now, in the past several months of uh, sort of chaos, I feel that the important news, some important news has been really lost in the shuffle. I know progress is being made in the world of myeloma, and things are still advancing. And there have been key FDA approvals that are providing myeloma patients with additional options for treatment. And this is particularly true for relapsed and refractory myeloma patients. So with us today is Dr. Tom Martin, a renowned myeloma specialist at the University of California at San Francisco, to share one of these important approvals, a new monoclonal antibody targeting CD38 called isotuximab or sarclissa. And um, welcome to the program, Dr. Martin. Hello. Thanks for having me. And before we get started, let me just introduce you quickly. Um, Dr. Thomas Martin is professor of medicine at UCSF and associate director of UCSF's myeloma program and director of the Unrelated Donor Transplant Program for Adults at the US UCSF Medical Center. Um, Dr. Martin is clinical research director of um, blood cancer malignancies at the US UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center, and his research interests include developing treatments for myeloma and leukemia, as well as expanding the use of bone marrow transplants. Uh, he has a special interest in umbilical cord transplants, interestingly, and is involved in efforts to improve outcomes for patients who have transplants from unrelated donors. Um, he earned his undergraduate at Cornell University and his medical degree at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And after residency at UCLA, he completed a fellowship in hematology oncology at UCSF. Uh, he then joined MD Anderson Cancer Center and then returned in 2001 to UCSF. So again, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for making time, especially as we're um, entering the weekend. So thank you so much. That's quite an introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, we are here today to talk about this newly approved drug, and maybe you just want to start with the basics if patients aren't familiar with it, and give us just an overview of uh, monoclonal antibodies, how they work, and um, just let's start there. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so monoclonal antibodies for multiple myeloma actually started uh, testing back in uh, 2010. And we were one of the first centers to actually start uh, investigations with esituximab. And we did a number of uh, studies in the laboratory to see how it worked and what the function was. And then we went on to do studies uh, in patients. Now, these um, antibodies, um, these CD38 antibodies, and there's another one against SLAMF7, elituzumab, that work by binding to the surface of the myeloma cell. They all bind a specific receptor. In the case of CD38, they, uh, or sorry, esituximab, they bind CD38. And it actually acts like a flag. So you have this flag on ta on, uh, attached to the cell surface, and you have many of them. And so our immune system is prepared to look at cells that have antibodies bound to them as being foreign. So what happens is when the, all these antibodies bind to the myeloma cell, our macrophages, our NK cells, are parts of our immune system that really uh, interrogate all the spaces around our body, say, wow, that's a bad guy, and they actually then go and kill cells that have these antibodies coded on them. So these antibodies, they're, they're called naked antibodies because they work in a passive way, meaning they just bind to the cell and they promote some of these immune cells to come over and, and chew them up and eat them and, and kill them, which is great. Now, what we found out um, over time, actually, there's a few other mechanisms of action for these drugs. Now, esituximab specifically, one of the things it can do by binding to CD38 is by binding to that receptor, it can induce a cell death signal inside the cell. So the cell actually... Um, has an ongoing circuit that says, okay, this antibody's bound, I should kill myself, and it can undergo cell death called apoptosis. So that's one of the ways that <clears throat> esituximab, that's kind of unique to esituximab, can kill the cell. But the other way is when you have multiple antibodies bound, there's another, there's another set of proteins that's called complement, and our complement also can see antibodies bound to cells, and they combine to a bunch of antibodies 
and line up a bunch of proteins on those antibodies. And actually they can work by pushing a hole through the cell surface. And so the complement works by pushing a hole through the, through the myeloma cell surface and, and, and thus killing the cell. Uh, another interesting way. And CD38 actually has enzymatic function. It um, controls a lot of calcium metabolism, um, and it controls other um, uh, cell surface um, molecules that can actually send signals to the local environment, specifically to the um, the microenvironment and to the immune cells in the environment, and they can tell them to either you know, be passive, to that, ah, don't worry about us, we're fine, or be active, hey, come help, give us some help. And so by blocking that enzyme, we actually may be able to um, – help the immune system engage into the myeloma cell and kill off the myeloma cell. So it has a bunch of different uh, activities. But lastly, there are other cells that are around the microenvironment of the bone marrow where these cells live, including some T cells and B cells mm -hmm. that are called regulatory cells that do give this negative signal to the immune system. It's, ah, these guys are okay. Don't worry about them. And CD38 binds to some of these regulatory cells and eliminates them. And so you get, get more of a signal to come kill this guy. Let's, let's take this guy out. So multiple mechanisms um, and has proven really over the last five years of, of clinical research to be quite uh, a potent uh, therapeutic for patients with multiple myeloma in combination with a number of drugs. Mm -hmm. And why is CD38 such a popular target? It the, seems like the, it's pretty the thing great that stands, target. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing that stands out about CD38 is its its expression on the cell surface is very high in the malignant plasma cell, much higher than a normal plasma cell and much higher than some of the other cells in the body that have CD38 on them, like some of the T cells and the um, B regulatory cells. Um, and even some blood cells can have a little um, CD38 on them in, in stem cells. Those levels are really low. So, in fact, most of the antibodies go and bind to the myeloma cells because they have so many of these receptors on them. Um, and that's really what's been uh, so uh, positive in terms of, you know, really targeting the myeloma cell is these cells are coded, extremely coded with all these antibodies. And that just makes it a lot easier for the immune system to see it and kill it. Whereas some of the other ones that have less expression of CD38 hopefully don't get killed. Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, this is one that can work independently of other myeloma drugs, although they're used in combination. It looks like CD38 might be a better target. I know like SLAM F7 is not, in a monoclonal antibody, is not really uh, super effective by itself, but maybe with other myeloma drugs. Yes, yeah, so we tested that um, both with, there's two, you know, CD38 now, Daratumab and this one, Isituximab. Right. We tested mm -hmm. Isituximab back in the early teens, 2012, 13, 14, um, as a single agent in patients that were um, relapsed after receiving the standard immunomodulatory drugs like Revlimid or lenalidomide or bortezomib or otherwise known as Velcid. Um, and in the fractory population, the response rate was somewhere between 20 and 30%. Now, that's amazing hmm. for just an antibody to get a 20 to 30%. Right. But that... And in combination with other drugs, we've shown that now we can even double that, sometimes even almost triple that with some of the combinations that potentially we'll talk about. Yeah, awesome. And um, you mentioned daratumumab. I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. Do you want to explain what the difference is um, between isotuximab and daratumumab? I know Paul Richardson or Dr. Richardson last on our last show mentioned that they just kind of – they're similar in ways, but they have different mechanisms of action. So, Yeah, they are actually, in fact, different. And they were, in terms, of, um, in terms of drug development, usually what happens is when you look to get an antibody against a, a particular cancer, you look, you target it for one mechanism first, and then you see if the other mechanisms actually also work. So when isotuximab was developed, it was actually developed in mind for it to induce that apoptotic signal, that just the antibody binding to the cell would kill the cell. And so they selected isotuximab amongst many other different candidates based on its ability to kill the cell by itself with just the binding of the antibody to the cell surface. 
this had no immune cells, uh, cells associated with it. This was just simply mm. the binding. Now, um, daratumumab was actually, um, it was developed based on its ability to induce that complement dependent cytotoxicity. So they selected, a, they had a bunch of candidate antibodies, and when they um, found daratumumab, they said, wow, this is the one that really produces the highest amount of CDC. And if you, you compare those two in the test tube, daratumumab does more CDC, and ezetuximab mm-hmm. does more apoptosis. So they actually do what, well, how they were developed. Now, in addition, if you look at CD38 is actually, it's a 3D protein that comes off the cell surface. And if you look at the 3D structure of the protein and where that, that antibody binds, there's actually very little overlap between where DR2 map, map binds and where esetuximab binds. And esetuximab 2 might have a little bit more potent inhibition of the enzymatic activity of CD38. So those are the kind mm-hmm. of biochemical and structural differences in terms of the binding of those drugs. Now, I will say that when we go to, you know, the clinical results, if we go to all the studies that we've done, single agent studies, combinations with lenalidomide or revlimid or pomalist or pomalidomide or, you know, bortezomib, okay, they're very similar, actually, when you combine them with drugs in terms of if you do it in the relapse setting or if you do it front, front line with either one of those drugs, they both have very similar clinical response rates, which is interesting. Yeah, and very, it's, I think it's fascinating, and I think patients are going to want to see over time. I want to ask some questions about just FDA approval in general, because I know the first approval for isotuximab is with pomalidomide and dexamethasone in the relapse setting, and that's most of the time where um, drugs get approved is in the highly relapsed setting, and then they kind of bring things up to the newly diagnosed setting, um, same with daratumumab. I've seen a lot of, it seems like the, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are in the newly diagnosed setting. So do you want to just give patients just a quick overview of this approval process? And um, I think from a patient standpoint, it's very exciting that all of these drugs are approved. And as we're watching COVID, things try to get like hyper rapid <laughs> approved. It's just, yeah. uh, I don't know, it seems like we have to wait a long time to get things approved. But I guess that's just the I process. Know. It is, unfortunately. It is, a, it is a long road from when the drug is first actually used in the test tube, then in mice or animal models, then in humans, and then until we actually, it's on the shelf and we can just, you know, put, pay, yeah. pull it off the shelf and use it for a patient outside of a clinical trial. It's too long. COVID, I I think I do agree with you that COVID has changed that a bit because the research for Mm -hmm. COVID is going so fast right now. And we're seeing that, you know what, maybe we do have too many regulations in place. We, we, you know, we have to do these things much faster because it's, you know, patients need these drugs, et cetera. I agree. Now, so for esituximab, uh, when we showed that it worked as a single agent and also we showed that it worked um, in the relapse refractory setting, the initial study that we, we did and we published was together with um, lenalidomide or revlimid in dexamethasone in the relapse setting. And even in patients who were um, refractory to revlimid, if we combined esituximab with revlimid and dexamethasone in a clinical trial, and we did that, we showed that in the refractory setting, like the, we wouldn't expect them to respond to revlimid, we saw an overall response rate of 50%. And we were really oh, wow. excited about that result. Yeah, yeah and, and, no kidding. and we published that we published that a few years ago in blood. And that led to us saying, okay, so these antibodies work really good with these immunomodulatory drugs with lenalidomide. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably we thought the best way to do the drug development with esituximab, the fastest way to try to get it then approved was to go to a, even a later line of therapy in patients who, um, you know, this drug could be combined with, uh, with pomalidomide, a different immunomodulatory drug. So at that point in time, pomalidomide and dexamethasone was considered one of the standard treatments for people who had um, refractory disease and were refractory to lenalidomide or revlimid. So if you're refractory to that drug, the next drug you give is pomalidomide and usually combine it with dex. Well, so mm-hmm. um, what Sanofi did is ask the FDA, you know, is it okay if we do a randomized trial where 
half the patients get pomalidomide dexamethasone, like would, which was standard, and then half the patients would get esetuximab plus pomalidomide dexamethasone. And so, and thus, um, you know, for approval, they said yes, thus a large phase three trial was done. And so it was a very, it was an international large phase three trial. Um, over 300 patients were involved. And basically, the three drug combination of esetuximab, pomalidomide, dexamethasone is a much higher response rate, over 60%. Um, compared to POM and DEX, where the response rate was just over 30%. And people stayed in remission longer. So that's called progression-free survival. Um, and so the progression-free survival was actually 11 and a half months in the, the triple drug, ESA, POM, DEX arm, versus just over six months for the POM, DEX arm. So doubling mm -hmm. in the remission duration and a doubling of the response rate. So it really you know, w worked quite well. And with that, with those data, the FDA said, um, sure, it's, it's now approved for use. And it's approved for use in patients who have relapse refractory myeloma, uh, who've had two prior lines of therapy. And, there, and there's the label. And that's the first approval. Yeah. And, you know, it, hopefully everybody will be able to use it soon. Right. And um, now that it's been approved, I know there are a lot of clinical trials, so let's talk about some of those. Um, so ASCO just happened, and mm -hmm. there was a trial with um, esetuximab with KRD, or Kyprolis Revlimid Dex, for high-risk myeloma, and I think that was newly diagnosed as well, right? Yes. Yep, that was done by Katja uh, Wiesel from Germany, um, one of my favorite myeloma people. Um, <laughs> she's awesome. She does wonderful research. She did a nice um, study in Germany where they had high-risk patients, and um, if they were young and fit they, and were eligible for transplant, uh, they received esetuximab with um, Kyprolis, Revlimid, and dexamethasone, um, so IKRD, um, and they got a uh, several cycles, collection of stem cells, autologous transplant, um, and then additional cycles afterwards, um, followed by maintenance-based therapy. And she showed an impressive um, overall response rate of 100%. Um, yeah, that's and, amazing. Yeah, 100% response rate. And so they also showed that these responses were quite deep. And in the first group of patients that – have proceeded past the stem cell transplant phase, and they looked at minimal residual disease testing. Over 60% of them were MRD negative. So that's an that that's going to be a really impressive combination for frontline, um, you know, treatment. Um, now, obviously, we can't use that right now because it's not FDA approved and it's still in clinical research trials. And most of the frontline uh, studies, they're going to take a long time these days because the, the regimens are so potent. We probably would expect those people that now get IKRD, we expect for them to be in remission upwards of six to maybe as many as eight years. So they're going to yeah. be in remission from frontline therapy for quite a long time, and that's together with transplant. Now, she also did it in some patients that were older, older than I think it was 70 years of age, um, that you know, did not undergo transplant and, again, saw an extremely high, over 90% over 90 response rate, an extremely high response rate in that population. Amazing. Well, let's talk about MRD testing. Yeah, that is amazing. Let's talk about MRD testing for a minute because um, I know people are looking to use minimal residual disease testing or this MRD testing potentially as an earlier clinical trial endpoint instead of waiting those six to eight years that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, what's and, and I noticed that some of these um, clinical trials, when they were doing the MRD testing, looked like they were using mass spectrometry um, in in some of the MRD testing. Do you just want to weigh in on that? Like, how could we shorten up some of these results so that we don't have to wait another six to eight years to just get something approved for newly diagnosed myeloma? Yeah, that is a really great question. So the primary endpoint for Dr. Weasel's study was MRD negativity. Um, oh, okay. Now, in the phase three trial, so far in phase three trials, 
the FDA has not allowed MRD to be the primary endpoint. Okay. Mm-hmm. But let's, right. let's think about what, what I just said and what you, and the question you asked, and that is if it's really going to take us 10 years of follow-up to do a trial in frontline of myeloma, how are, how are we going to, you know, encourage more people, more pharmaceutical companies to do these trials if it's going to take 10 years to get the results? They're never going to be able to license their drug in that area. Or at that, you know, it's going to take yeah. a decade. That, that's too long. So, yeah. but if we could have, what we, if what we're trying to find, and especially in a study like Dr. Weasel's study, and that is if we find that at two years or three years later, that with this study, that we get 60, 70, 80% of the people that are MRD negative. And then we follow those people of time and we show that those patients that are MRD negative, in fact, do have a PFS of eight mm-hmm. to nine years then we can potentially use MRD at the two or three year time point to tell us that those patients are going to be in remission for eight to nine years. So if we're comparing two study, two different uh, arms of a study, and we say, okay, let's compare at two years what the MRD rate is. If in one it's 90% and the other is 20 at two years, then of course the one that's 90 is going to be doing better than the one at 20 five years down the road and 10 years down the road. And so that's what we're trying to say to the FDA is we want to use it as an early assessment of how well the study arms are doing so we don't have to wait the 10 years. I think we're almost there. The FDA wants from us, the myeloma community, more data to show them that the early time point of MRD negativity does correlate to improve remission durations, progression-free survival, and maybe at some point would um, show over time, improved overall survival. But right now, we're just looking for progression-free survival. So that's mm-hmm. where we think MRD testing is going to come in handy with frontline studies. Yeah, I well, I would applaud that because it, it's just we can't wait ten years <laughs> to get to get Correct. one indication. Correct. That's just ridiculous. Especially yep. with all the different combinations, there's just no way that you can run that many clinical trials for in all the different combinations that need to be run. It doesn't make sense. Well, um, so the, the, yeah, the conclusion yeah, for, for patients, I think, out of this is that, is that we are doing so much better in that this is a good problem for us to have, to say mm-hmm. that, oh, my gosh, the first treatment you're going to get, you're going to stay in remission for six, seven, eight, maybe ten years. That yeah, is fantastic. awesome, right? Because <laughs> when, when you go to get your second regimen six for years from now or eight years from now or ten years from now, it's even going to be better than the one you're getting now because all the drugs we're testing down the road are going to be even better than these ones. So it's all good. It's all really good for the patient. Yeah, no, it's great. And the use of quad therapies, let's talk about that for a minute because a lot of these in the these ASCO results and in many clinical trials now are adding um, drugs like Isotexumab to a a triplet that's normal, you know, for like induction therapy or whatever. And um, quads seem to be kind of the way people are going. What do you think? Well, yeah. So I think there was another, there was another presentation um, from Spain looking at isotuximab together with either Velcade, Cytoxin and Dexamethasone, what we used to call Cyborg D or isotuximab plus, um, uh, RVD, Revmid, uh, Bortezomib, or Velcade, and Dexamethasone. And both of those had really high response rates, more than 90%. Um, I do think that the combination of the antibody plus an, um, an immunomodulatory drug like, you know, Revlimid, plus a proteasome inhibitor, and that's either Bortezomib, Velcade, or Carfilzomib, Kyprolis, yeah, with dexamethasone, that those four drugs together are incredibly potent at the current time for frontline based therapy. Um, we've had, you know, we've had data um, now from multiple meetings with four drug combinations in the frontline setting, including a CD38 uh, antibody, and it's just really impressive how deep of uh, remissions we're getting. And some people think that, you know, in some of the combinations, the four drug combinations, again, that we're going to see 
remission durations, you know, pushing eight, nine, and 10 years. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. It's so fantastic. So in the Spain, uh, in the Spanish study with the VCD versus VRD for newly diagnosed myeloma, did they include a transplant too? Because the German study did, right? Yeah. Um, that one was not, in, that was not transplant based therapy. Mm-hmm. Okay. As far, as far as I remember, I don't think there was transplant in there. I don't know. Do you, I can't remember on that one. Do you know I, I don't, that one? I don't think so. I don't think so. But, I don't think there was transplant in that. No. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's great. So, well, it sounds like with the German study, doing this kind of quad and then following up with transplant and then doing it as consolidation or something may be the way to go, especially for these high-risk patients. I, I guess, is there any indication that um, isotuximab has special impact for high-risk patients or specific genetic features? Um, so it's a great, it's a very good question. Um, so in all the the um, relapse refractory studies that we've done with these Tuxmam, the um, the high risk patients have done better than we would have expected, um, and mm-hmm. so it does look like it contributes to the combination. However. There, there's no drug at the current time or no combination in my mind that eliminate completely eliminates some of the effects of high risk disease. We're still looking for, for more drugs to help, you know, make high risk disease respond just as well as non high risk disease. So that we're still looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it. Well, that's a, such an interesting study that she did with the uh, high risk genetics, especially in newly diagnosed. Because yep, I guess absolutely. you just never know how like evolved it, it, their their myeloma is by that point, right? Correct. And in her study, the really the the important component, she had a great response rate, et cetera. The important component will be how long that remission will last, and that's going to be the the key of that. That is how. How long will that remission last? Do you know how long the follow-up was on that study? I'm just curious. It's still short. It's still very short. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, we, okay. For, for high risk, we got to follow them at least 24 to 36 months because some people with high risk, you know, end up starting to relapse within 18 to 24 months, and, and that's um, where we start to see uh, some treatment failures, and that's, that's the time point. And it was, I think it, it, it wasn't quite, quite more than a year for that follow-up. Mm-hmm. And then I saw that there were other studies that were open or going to open or something with um, isotuximab with like bendamustine, which is another chemotherapy, right? And prednisone. And then yes. um, do you want to, uh, you can skip over sure. any of these or talk about them in more detail, whatever you prefer. Yeah. So I think in terms of the next generation of studies for isotuximab, um, what I think are the two most important ones, one is a phase three trial that um, is, has been accepted as a late-breaking abstract at EHA, and EHA mm-hmm. uh, is next week. Um, mm-hmm. And this, um, this study is also a fa- um, in relapse, a phase three in relapse refractory myeloma, and it's esituximab plus carfilzomib index versus carfilzomib index. And so it was a three-drug oh, versus a two-drug combination. And um, although I can't, I can't reveal all the results right now, I will tell you that it, it was accepted as a late-breaking abstract because it's going to be a really big splash in terms of, in my mind, you know, like most of these studies have shown that three-drug is better than the two-drug. Um, and I think, you know, we can anticipate that hopefully esituximab plus carfilzomib index is, is a good combination. Now we've we we started that that um, combination of esituximab and carfilzomib. We treated the first patient with that combination mm. at UCSF back in 2015. Uh, so wow. we started the study that actually led to this phase three study, um, and we did it because carfilzomib induces apoptosis, um, and esituximab, like I, I, I've, I've said, you know, one of the mechanisms yeah. of act, action is to do, induce apoptosis. So we thought there would be some synergy between those two. And we've always found a great 
them to be a great combination. And, and we um, have presented at ASCO a couple of years ago preliminary results of our esituximab plus carfilzomib data, and we showed that even in people that were carfilzomib refractory, if we added esituximab, we saw responses. Even The response rate was even as high as 60%. So the two together actually wow. work quite good. So that's yeah, one. That's an, so the e-cetuximab yeah. mm-hmm. is gonna it's gonna be, I think it'd be a great combination with carfilzomib index. So that's one study that I'm very excited about. And data should be available literally in the next um I think it's the fourteenth is the presentation. So uh, you know, eight days, nine days. Oh, that's um, great. We're gonna so, have a round table for for um so this is the European Hematology Association for people that don't know what EHA is. Correct. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it usually follows to a week or two or three after ASCO. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and you're always some usually the, there. <laughs> yeah. Except not this yeah. year. Right. Not this year, unfortunately. I'll be there by yeah. video. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other trial that I think is going to be an important trial is called the EMROSE trial. Um, and this is... Um, the licensing trial for a four-drug combination. It's esituximab, revlimid, velcade, and dexamethasone versus revlimid, velcade, and dexamethasone as treatment of newly diagnosed frontline multiple myeloma. Mm-hmm. And that trial is ongoing and, and is being evaluated, you know, for um, responses and remission durations. And they're, you know, they basically do every once in a while look at the results of the study the statisticians look to see if they have to unblind it or stop the study because one arm is better than the other. So right now they're just watching the arms to see if one arm proves to be better than the other. So that one potentially could be the um, approval, the, uh, you know, lead to the approval of a four drug combination as frontline therapy um, for multiple myeloma with these tux maps. So I have a question. So I know you said, you know, like some of these approvals may take six to eight years, but if there's already something approved in the drug class um, in general, does that speed up that process in terms of bringing esotuximab up closer to the newly diagnosed setting? Or is it just the same? You just have to go through the same process and it's just all the same. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great question. So sometimes if – in the space, like so in the relapse refractory space, sometimes if um, the drug is approved in that relapse refractory space and there's a, fa- a large phase two study that shows a promising um, response rate and no additional toxicity from combining the drugs, sometimes the FDA will say, we will give you approval for that combination in that space. However, when it comes to new, if you're going to a different space, like to the newly uh, diagnosed space, that's not, there's no, um, uh, I'll I'll say there's no free lunch in terms of that, um, Mm -hmm. in that uh, regard. The FDA makes you test your drug in that line, in that specific space. So for all of these, uh, you know, CD38 antibodies and and even uh, the SLAM F7 antibody, elotuzumab, to get into that space, you have to do a phase three randomized trial. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes sense, especially because they have different, it sounds like they approach things differently anyway, and they're not exactly the same. So that makes yep. sense that they would need to test it all. Let's Can we talk about isotuximab for smoldering myeloma? Because I saw some trials there as well. Yes, so there is going to be a trial. There is an ongoing trial. It's been going on for a while with esotuximab in the, in the smoldering myeloma space, uh, with the with the um, premise that you're simply using an immune based therapy in the um, in the smoldering myeloma. You're not um, hopefully going to induce any long term side effects from it, but you're merely trying to. Um, enlighten the patient's own immune system to where those bad cells are and to go and get them, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I have to say that I'm, I'm a little biased um, about smoldering multiple myeloma. Um, and my bias is um, smoldering myeloma is essentially a time where um, you're catching a patient that um, has likely early multiple myeloma, 
and that if you following, follow them more over time, they are going to have some symptoms from those malignant plasma cells. They're going to grow to a certain amount, and they're going to be symptomatic. The hard mm-hmm. part is you don't really know in that time between they're not symptomatic to when they're symptomatic, but when's the right time to do therapy? When is the right time to start therapy? And the other question is, is not just when is the right time to start, but then what really is the best medicine? So none of us for newly diagnosed active myeloma, none of us are saying, let's just use a CD38 antibody in, that, in the mm-hmm. newly diagnosed myeloma. We're giving them three and four drug combinations, right? right. So my bias yeah. is just to use an antibody in smoldering myeloma. It's probably not the right um, setting. It, smoldering myeloma, there's probably a couple different groups of patients there. Those that are soon to be active myeloma and you really should treat them like active myeloma. Or mm-hmm. there's another group of patients who have really low, kind of smoldering, low proliferative, very, um, I, sometimes I call sleeping myeloma, where it's really not that active. And you might be able to wait five or 10 years before doing something. So why perturb that? person at that point in time, unless you can make it go away completely and cure that person at that point in time. I think sometimes it's best to be left alone and let the immune system do it, what it's doing, hopefully keeping it sleeping. So I have, Mm -hmm. I have some biases in the smoldering myeloma camp in terms of whether we should use CD38 antibodies in that space. Well, it's so interesting. I I watched one of Dr. Loniel's presentations uh, from ASCA where he was talking about smoldering myeloma, and he was just saying smoldering myeloma like isn't really different. It's just the absence of this end organ damage. And then they were talking yeah. about some of these early like the Caesar trial where they were just throwing everything at smoldering myeloma, yep. and still yep. patients weren't. It wasn't like it was curing everybody. So I don't know. It just made me think like just what you said. <laughs> Exactly. So we don't don't have the solution. No, we don't. We don't have the solution. And for me, it's not just the C38 antibody. It's not just Revlimid. We need something better. Um, And, uh, and, you know, so these, the C38 antibodies are the, I said, you know, are naked antibodies. They require some help from the immune system. And in the next, you know, two to five to 10 years, we're going to be in more of a space of these active immunotherapy. It th- therapies, these bi-specific T cell engagers, and these other drugs that might actually have a better role in that early smoldering myeloma space. That, that's that's my suspicion. But that's for that's for next time, new days. Yeah, and can I ask you a question about what you, what you just said too? Um, you kind of were talking about different. Well, it just made me think of a question about the current status of your immune system. So. Maybe the smolders are able to continue smoldering because their immune system is at a certain status or um, powerful enough to kind of tamp it down. Do you do you see any work being done on identifying the difference in immune system status and why some patients are progressing from smoldering myeloma or relapsing faster or um, those types of things? Because it seems to me that it would make a lot of sense to just say, okay, yeah. your immune system is this status and you're more likely to do this, so we're going to do more for you just because you have a weaker immune system. Yep. Um, I mean, and that, that's actually the Black Swan Project from the mm-hmm. IMF. That is, mm-hmm. the, that is the goal of the Black Swan, is to figure out what is the trans, you know, the, basically the, the transition zones from MGUS to smoldering myeloma, some smoldering myeloma to active myeloma, what are those transitions? And so uh, th- that is being heavily investigated by many researchers, including those in, in, um, in Iceland. Um, and so mm-hmm. Iceland has a very homogenous population, and they're looking at their MGUS patients, and they're looking at the genetics and isolating bone marrow cells and the immune microenvironment cells and trying to see, okay, which one of these immune cells are really the ones that are keeping everything in check or which ones are, are, are going to sleep and not doing their job and letting the myeloma progress. And also what are the genetics of the progression? Is there something happening inside that myeloma cell, et cetera? So that's part of the Black Swan initiative. There is another initiative from the MMRF that's, that's looking at, you know, this transition. Irene Gobriel from, from, um, 
Dana Farber is also doing tremendous work on um, looking at these early precancerous stages and why do these patients progress. And she has a huge database, and she asks patients to those with smoldering and MGUS to um, you know, go to her website and put their information in so they can have this huge big database about it. So there's a lot of research actually going on in this. And it, this, is a, this is going to be key for us to cure myeloma before it happens. Right, right. So, so much so. Let's talk about administration of esotuximab for a minute. Um, how is it administered and how is it different from other options? Oh, yeah. So that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so, um, Esituximab is, is administered uh, by an IV infusion, um, and it's given on um, for the first cycle weekly. So it's four doses for the first cycle, and then starting from the second cycle onward, it's given every other week. So it continu- it's continued to be given every other week, uh, ongoing. Um, so um, for the IV administration, um, typically for a um, the dose is 10 milligrams per kilogram. For the first dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram, typically it's in the order of three and a half to four and a half hours for that first dose. And then mm-hmm. subsequent doses afterwards, it's more in the two and a half to three hour range for the subsequent doses. Now, um, Saad Usmani um, uh, presented mm-hmm. at the European hematology meetings last year um, that you, after the third dose, that you, that you can give it actually over a faster time point. You can actually give it over 75 minutes uh, without toxicity. So they have started started that study, and they, they're giving it, um, or that study proved that you could give it over 75 minutes. So, you know, just an hour and 15 minutes, which is, you know, pretty, that's pretty um, doable, I think, for most, most patients. Um, when we were developing esituximab, we actually tested a higher dose. We tested 20 milligrams per kilogram. Mm. Um, and in fact, it just took, it took a lot longer. The first dose was about six hours, and subsequent doses were four to five hours. And when we looked actually at how much medicine was left in the system after you did that and, um, you know, how, how many responders, you know, versus the 10 milligrams, what we found is we probably were, for most of the patients, giving more dose than we needed. And so um, in combination with other agents, esituximab, I think um, the optimal biologic dose, and now it'll be the approved dose with esituximab, um, pomalidomide index, and then eventually if it gets approved for, with carfilzomib or kyprolis, it'll be, again, 10 milligrams per kilogram esituximab plus, plus kyprolis index. Um, is the optimal dose, especially when used in combination. So that, that's, that's in general how it's going, given. It is um, given intravenous, and as you know, that dare 2 map just got a FDA approved for subcutaneous injection. So mm-hmm. um, right. there, there are studies that are going to test esituximab in the subcutaneous um, administration mechanism, but uh, right now, we have all we have is IV. It'll be IV formulation. Nice. And then, how does it compare with infusion-related reactions? I know people that was kind of a new side effect um, that people weren't that familiar with, and now they're more familiar with it. And it's not, you know, it's manageable. But is it any I, different? A, yeah. Well, so that's a really good question. I think there there are some slight differences. We haven't seen as much, I think, of a respiratory. Uh, symptoms like like cough and shortness of breath um, with esituximab, and so the standard pre pre medication uh, regimen is to use um, uh, corticosteroid, either intravenous dexamethasone or methylprednisolone, for the, at least for the first one or two doses, together with um, uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, or um, um, also at H um, Two blocker. Typically, we give famotidine, um, and um, in essentially with those with those combined, the resp- responses or the infusion reaction rate is about forty percent. Um, mm-hmm. Now, typically, what I do is when patients are getting their therapy, they sometimes can first notice, yeah, you know, I get a little, I'm having a little trouble clearing my throat, or I'm getting a little sinus congestion. 
And right away, any one of those symptoms, I typically will give them more of a steroid. I'll give them another 50 or 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone, and I'll give them a little Mm -hmm. bit more of um, Benadryl, another, say, 25 milligrams of Benadryl. And typically, take away those symptoms without even having to stop uh, the infusion. But if people have significant symptoms, and they're usually grade two, where they do have cough or they feel short of breath or they have you know, blood pressure can go up or down for briefly, you have to stop, uh, give them more pre-medications, and then restart it. So uh, I think more than half the time, I don't even have to, um, when, if with an infusion reaction, I don't even have to stop the infusion. I can just give them more pre-medications. Um, and so, um, you know, people have to watch it. The infusion-related reactions almost uniformly happen on the first reaction, and then by the second reaction, they still have the drug in their system. It's still there. So typically when they see the protein again on the second administration, there's usually not uh, an infusion-associated reaction. There's also no, there's no steroid medication on the second or third day um, orally after getting esetuximab. So we don't give steroids on the second or third day. Okay, yeah, that's great to know. So I know a question that everybody will ask is, um, and this question goes both ways. So if you start with esotuximab and you become um, a relapse after it, or if you start daratumumab, can you use alternately the other drug? Like if you start with ESA, can you go to Dara? If you start with Dara, can you go to ESA? Like does that, I know that's just going to be a common question for everyone. Yeah, so that's really um that's really a great question. And, you know, the answer is, there, there's two answers to that. Uh, the first answer is no, and the second answer is maybe. Um, and the reason the first action, the answer is no is we typically won't go from, um, say, an early relapse regimen using a CD38 antibody, say daratumumab. Say somebody mm-hmm. is on daratumumab plus lenalidomide and dexamethasone, or DRD, what we do DRD, and then they relapse. You know, we wouldn't give them esetuximab, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone as their next regimen. And the reason is, is because those myeloma cells at that point in time, they probably have downregulated the a number of CD38 receptors on the cell surface. And so using a different antibody at that point in time is not effective because the cell surface receptor is not there. It's not there in mm-hmm. adequate quantity to make it work. So typically, the answer is no. You can't go from one CD38 right to the other uh, CD38. Now, the answer maybe is because you can if you wait. So if you do, um, you know, dare to mab, um, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, on DRD for first relapse, and then they relapse, and on second relapse, you give them maybe you give them pomalidomide, cyc- cytoxin, and dexamethasone. Then you can at that point after that one, then you can go to esetuximab. Um, mm. Or if you give carfilzomib as the second one, you can go to esetuximab, pomalidomide, dexamethasone. You need to give a regimen in between the regimens, and then over time, actually without the pressure of the CD38 antibody on, the third CD38 receptors will come back onto the cell surface, and we've seen that from clinical specimens for patients treated with anti-C38 antibodies. If you wait over time, the receptor density goes back up to a good level. That's crazy. And is there anything that can upregulate the CD38 receptors um, without just waiting for it naturally? Well, that is a really, really great question. So we are testing that at a research trial at UCSF right now, actually, Mm -hmm. where our first patient hopefully will be enrolled in the next four to six weeks. And so we're using um, what's called a hypomethylating agent, an HMA, and the agent we're using is a medicine called azacitidine. And what we found in the laboratory is that if we pre-treat some of these um, CD38 um, negative um, or low um, expressing cells with this HMA molecule, we can actually increase the expression of CD38 on the cell surface. So we're taking CD30, we're taking CD38 refractory cases, and then we're wow. giving them first the azacitidine, and then we're going to give them um, the CD38 antibody. So we're giving the azacitidine first. We're going to we're going to harvest some of their bone marrow cells afterwards. See that that we've actually done of our effect. We've upregulated 30, CD38, and then we're going to give CD38, you know, as a clinical um, treatment 
and see if they respond. So we're, we are testing that. So that, that, that is a great, great question. Yeah, that's going to be so fascinating. Wow. Okay. Are there any um, considerations that patients need to think about when using isotuximab during COVID, the COVID situation? Well, that's a good question. So um, I will say that all of the antibodies that we currently have, all the C38 antibodies and the SLAMF7 antibodies, they do produce some form of immune suppression, meaning they do um, uh, decrease the number of lymphocytes that people have in their blood. And they also, over time, decrease the number of antibodies, protective antibodies uh, in their blood. So people need to be on, you know, prophylaxis for um, reactivation of zoster virus or shingles, the chickenpox virus. Mm -hmm. So people take Mm -hmm. prophylaxis for that. And if they're getting steroids, I also have them on a medication to prevent a a, a special pneumonia called pneumocystis. So they take a a medicine to prevent that too. The preventatives tend to work, so you have to take them. Now, what I've told all my patients in the setting of COVID is, you know, these are immunosuppressive medicines. These have the potential of making you at higher risk of having a more difficult time clearing that virus from your body. And so right now, the only, the best defense is to not get it. Um, And, you know, here in the Bay Area, we've done extremely well with, thankfully, knock on wood, with shelter in place. And as long Mm -hmm. as you do, you wear a mask, you wear gloves if you're out, especially a cancer patient, you wear gloves if you're out. You try not to touch your face, your mouth, your eyes, nothing, no entry portal uh, with your gloves or your hands while you're out and doing that, and just good um, hand hygiene, et cetera. Most treatment centers, like UCSF and other treatment centers around the country now, are pre-screening all patients that go to the center, meaning the patient's getting a call before they get there. They're asking, Mm. do they have symptoms? If they do have symptoms, they're not allowed in the treatment center. They can get treatment outside the treatment center. Typically, all centers have set up other infusion areas outside of the treatment or the protected treatment center where we don't want COVID. Uh, But so patients should feel comfortable going to the clinics right now because we're we're doing really a lot of work to make it safe for all the patients. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of that, and um, kudos to you for doing that. And, I, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things that can suppress the immune system, like Revlimid, if you're taking too high of a dose, can, can do that too. And like you said, the the uh, steroids, so it's not necessarily just something like this. Yeah, the Revlimid, the Revlimid thing is a really interesting phenomenon. So uh, 10 years ago, one of our researchers from the laboratory said, you know, this Revlimid, it stimulates the immune system why don't we give it to patients in the nursing home during mm-hmm. flu season? And maybe it will mm-hmm. protect them against flu season. Now, in fact, because mm-hmm. Revlimid has so many other side effects, we didn't allow him to do that study. He did want to give it to patients in nursing homes to try to prevent flu. So mm-hmm. I don't know what will happen with Revlimid. That's kind of, it's really kind of an unknown, in fact. That's interesting. But most of the time, patients are not just taking Revlimid. And they should consider all patients who've been through stem cell transplant or on maintenance, everybody should consider themselves immunocompromised. And the best thing to do is avoid any possible contact with COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Not a good time to be taking BART or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so my last question before I open it up for caller questions would be, and you mentioned a little bit about this before, about pairing it with immunomodulators, but in what combinations do you see isotuximab being the most effective? And then once once we start doing other things like some of the bispecifics get approved or CAR-T gets approved, that opens things up to a whole new set of treatment combinations that are way beyond like RVD or KRD or something. But how do you, do you see that having any synergies or any issues or anything like that? Yeah, so that is really, um, well, let me take the first question um, um, and say that um, in terms of esituximab, I am really excited as a combination with pomalidomide. I think it'll work really well with pomalidomide. I'm also really excited, and I think, uh, knock on wood, I think the data that you're going to see in the next 10 or 14 days from EHA is going to show that it works really well with proteasome inhibitors too, like carfilzomib. 
And mm. we've seen it in our phase one with an expansion trial that the combination is very active with esetuximab plus carfilzomib. So I really like that combination too. And I think it's really easy to give. Um, we're going to do a, a large study now with esetuximab and weekly carfilzomib. The, the one you're going to hear on, at EHA is twice weekly, but we're going to do a study with some uh, centers across the country doing weekly uh, carfilzomib with esetuximab. I'm really excited about that. Now, I do think that the CD38 antibodies, they are um, at the current time going to be used in that relapse, relapse space with esetuximab uh, and pomalidomide, like approved, or esen carfilzomib. Um, but they're also they're going to be moved up to frontline, like like daratumab has been. It's going to move up to frontline, and I think many, most patients are going to get a CD38 antibody as part of frontline therapy. And again, mm-hmm. frontline therapy today, right now, I think is going to mean it's going to be five years or more down the line when you're going to need your next therapy. And I think that next therapy, in fact, is going to be some of these newer drugs. It's going to be some of these bispecific T cell engagers, or it might even be right to a car, uh, chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor T cell or a CAR T cell. That might be mm. the first therapy you get when you progress from frontline based therapy. Um, and hopefully, with frontline therapy and the first relapse therapy, hopefully, we're talking 10 to 15 years down the road now that people are going to do well for the first 10 or 15 years of their myeloma time, which is that's going to be an extra, uh, you know, an incredible advance. Yeah, that's extraordinary, and I vote for that. <laughs> I think that would be terrific for everybody, and hopefully for the high risk patients too. Um, okay, we'll open it up for a few caller questions. We have a question um, with caller eight four seven five seven four eight. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Martin. Thank you for um, uh, for the call. Um, my question is. For a patient that um, uh, turns MRD positive from an MRD negative status um, two years after a transplant, um, uh, and, and the maintenance regimen actually was uh, Dara, Palm, Dex, how quick are you to uh, to use the MRD positive as a um, reason to to change the treatment or become more aggressive? The, the biochemical relapse has not happened, but um, the MRD positivity has uh, has happened. How um, how quick are you to take action when uh, when a patient uh, turns MRD positive? Well, that's a um, extremely advanced question, and I and I like it. it, it and you know, so there's a um, there's a number of studies that are now um, underway that are going to look at. Um, you know, when we should initiate therapy post uh, MRD switch. Now, so what, I, so what I'll tell you right now is belief because there's no data to go right. by what your question is. So my belief. So when we looked in our MRD data set at, at UCSF, we found that, um, that you have to have at least a two log fold increase in the amount of MRD for that to be um, for us to worry that it's a true progression, or you need to have multiple um, treat multiple tests. Typically, a test is every you know every three or six months because it's a bone marrow biopsy. You have to have multiple tests that show over time a log fold you know increase, a log fold increase. Now, when we looked at the people that started to have the increase by MRD testing, what we found is from then to when we would call them progression. In other words, they met the definition of progression by IMWG was 13 months. So it isn't, so you have, for the majority of people, there's a median. For the majority of people, you have over six months, you have six months to a year, maybe even longer for some, to make a decision on what the next one is and what you have to do. And you have time to see the rate of the rise and also, you know, what's on the horizon and will you know, potentially you'd be eligible for some type of, of trial or uh, any other therapeutic that you don't want to um, miss out on by starting early therapy. So that's typically what, what we do. We, we wait and look at the, the rate of the rise and essentially um, start therapy only when somebody meets the definition of progression. The, uh, sorry, the definition of biochemical progression, meaning... 
Correct. The increase in Correct. Price, et cetera. Yep. But, but, but the uh, hundredfold rise in number of abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow aspirate, that's a trigger for what? You don't use that as a trigger to, to change the maintenance or, to, um, uh, or, or to, to try another agent. It's only, so, so basically, uh-huh, it just, you know that you have roughly 13 months until the biochemical relapse happens. Yes, exactly. But, but if, if, the, if the rise is even uh, faster, let's say uh, a three log rise in the space of uh, six months or a year, would that trigger a change in, um, in, 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 um, in regimen, even if uh, the biochemical relapse has not uh, occurred? You know, we would, I would have to say that it depends on the clinical scenario. So somebody, right. we knew that person maybe had a 1416 translocation or a 17P deletion, right. and now we see this kind of skyrocketing MRD. That might change my, you know, discussion with the patient, say, you know what, we could try to see if we can stave this off and, and you know, head it back in the right direction by starting early therapy. And, and so that, I think, is a one-to-one discussion between the doc and the patient. Right. Thank you. Okay, great. Yes. Thanks for your question. We also had an emailed-in question from Rosalind, and she said, is isatuximab a sulfa drug? And I don't know what a sulfa drug is, but maybe you can answer that question. There's no sulfa. No, there, in terms of allergy, no, there's no. If somebody has a sulfa allergy, oh, there's yeah, no yeah, cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no okay. cross-reactivity or an allergy to, um, yeah, isatuximab. Okay, great. I think she had a lot of allergies to sulfa. Okay, and then we have caller um, at ending in 6757. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Dr. Martin. It's Dana Holmes. Thanks so much for taking the call. Dr. Martin, do you need to um, have specific blood typing labs um, prior to the first infusion with uh, isotuximab for future blood transfusions? Um, Yeah, so... Another really great, you guys are awesome. Another really great question. What we're finding is that there probably is some CD38 on, um, on red blood cells um, in that um, any CD38 antibody will bind to um, the red blood cell and it will bind to the assay that's done in the blood bank to try to pick up an antibody if someone need, needs a blood transfusion. If you need a blood transfusion, we need to see in your serum, do you have an antibody that's going to bind to the red blood cells coming into your body? And so dare to map almost always, 100% of the time, you'd have a positive um, pre-screen that says, you got something in your blood that's binding to these red cells and, and we got to figure it out. And it's almost always that that's dare to map. With isotuximab, it's about half as high as dare 2 mass, probably about 50%, maybe 60%, but still it's high enough that yes, you have to have a sample sent to the blood bank before you get your therapy, just so the blood bank knows, and you need to tell anybody if you need a blood transfusion, I'm on map just like you do for dare 2 map And that's probably going to be for all CD38 therapeutics. They're probably mm-hmm. all going to do the same thing. Yes. Okay, and and what about, is there specific testing for uh, to tease out uh, uh, the artifact created by this drug, just like there is for Darzalex? There is, yes. In fact, there, there is, a, is. They actually can, yeah, the blood bank can treat it with a chemical to, to actually remove the CD38 receptor, and then, and then they find that the antibody doesn't bind, and they say, okay, well, it's the CD38, and let's not, let's not worry about it. We know they're on that they're drug. Okay, good. So that would, that would affect actual um, blood. Uh, in myeloma labs, though, too, correct, this artifact? Not necessarily. Well, so the antibody, um, because it's a little bit of a lower dose, I've mm-hmm. clinically found, because I've treated about 100 patients, I've had less patients that have had an artifact with their SPEP and their serum IFE than I have had with, um, with Darzalex. Really? Um, That's really but, interesting. I've had I've had less, but the, but but there's a there's a test that you can run to they, they've developed mm-hmm. a binding assay that you can just bind up the dare two map and do run the assay and it works fine. Great. Yeah. And 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 could you just take a minute to explain the limitations of bone marrow biopsy based MRD testing, um, specifically sample bias? 
How do we actually overcome that? Well, actually, so, yeah, I was asked that question earlier, and I didn't finish my answer. So thank you for bringing that up. So obviously the biggest biggest limitation for MRD testing is that it is a bone marrow biopsy, right? And the Uh truth of the matter is is that um, we don't have – a um, a smart needle to go in and say this is the perfect place to get that bone marrow biopsy from. This is a nice juicy spot. We you know numb up the backside, we go in the bone, and we hope that we get to a space where there's good bone marrow. There's never a hundred percent chance that you're going to get good bone marrow. So there is that that um, you know variability on the site that the needle goes into, and also myeloma is patchy. So in one right. site, you might have a lot. In another site, you might have a very little. So that is a big problem with MRD testing. So the two things that we're trying to do with that, one is to try to say, well, can we make it a blood test? Because the truth of the matter is, is some of those myeloma cells that are in the bone marrow, they do end up circulating in the blood. You know, it's a smaller number, but they do end up circulating in the blood. So we're trying to develop better assays so that we can detect some of the circulating myeloma cells and maybe if we could get a really better assay that can detect circulating myeloma cells, we'll be able to at least say when the circulating myeloma cells are completely gone, that that is a level of this much MRD. And we can do, we don't have to do bone marrow biopsies until we completely get to that level in the blood that's really low. And then if we mm-hmm. want to see if we can go even deeper, then we potentially can try the bone, the, the bone marrow. Now, the are second we one close is somebody, to those blood-based We are. Things? Yes, oh. I do think so, yes. I think within the next two to five years, but better yet, we have a better thing that's almost ready in the next year, and that is mass spectroscopy for evaluation okay. of M protein. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. everybody's myeloma yeah. cell makes a specific light chain and makes a specific heavy chain. Sometimes it doesn't make a heavy chain, only makes a light chain. Sometimes it doesn't make any. The majority of people have, a butt, have some heavy chain and have some light chain. And right now, the assay that we have to detect that is actually not that good. But if we do it by mass spec, which separates proteins by sizes and shapes, you actually can detect a very, very low level of that protein in the blood. And in fact, it may be, it may prove to be better than Mm. MRD testing in the bone marrow. And it will be be a blood test. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And so the, yeah, there's a, the binding site is working on that, this, this um, company called The Binding Site, and they're working mm-hmm. together with the Mayo Clinic, and they're opening seven centers across the country soon on doing, and starting to do this, this mass spec testing and, and quantitation of the M protein. So, Fabulous. Is that going yes. to be done in a clinical trial, or is it just going to be those seven centers will have that available? No, no seven um, locations, like uh, like seven places where they build, uh, you know, uh, Teslas oh, uh, okay. around the country. So so anybody okay. can use them, but mm-hmm. they're located. In, they're going to be located in like gotcha. seven geographically well designed places around the country. Okay, excellent. So well, Dr. Martin, thanks it. so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it very much. I live in New York City, so I've been quarantined for weeks and weeks and weeks, and um, you know, scary times. But you gave a lot of hope tonight in your discussion. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Good luck there, and yep, stay sheltered. Yes. Thank you so much. Good yeah, night now. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Great questions. Great questions, Dane. Thanks. Um, okay, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for joining us, especially on a Friday evening. Um, and we just really appreciate you weighing in and sharing this important therapy. I just felt like it was really important to not just overdo COVID all the time because progress is happening in myeloma. And we need to know about it as patients. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and we'd like to thank all our listeners of Myeloma Crowd Radio. And we invite you to tune in next time to learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere 
and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.